Mexico from the Olmecs to the Aztecs by Dr. Michael Coey and Rex Kuntz. Chapter 9 The Post Classic Period Rival States Late Zapotec Capture at Mitla. Of all the peoples of Mexico, the Zapotecs were among the most fortunate, for they had long been undisturbed in their beautiful valley by troublemakers from outside. The state of affairs was ended, however, when Monte Alban was abandoned at the end of the 8th century and a new force was spearheaded by a people infiltrating the valley of Oaxaca from the mountainous country lying in the northwest. But more of this later. In the early post-classic, a new center of Zapotec civilization sprang up at Mitla, about 25 miles southwest of Oaxaca City. The name is derived from the, from the Nahuatl Mictlan, or Land of the Dead. But to the Zapotecs, it was known as Leoba'a, Place of Rest. Not much, not very much is known about the archaeology about the archaeology of Milam, but it is thought to have been constructed in the Monte Alban the fifth period, corresponding to the Toltec and Aztec eras. It was still in use when the Spaniards arrived. Mila is one of the architectural wonders of ancient Mexico, not grandiose, not a mighty city, it is true, but of unparalleled beauty. Five architectural groups are scattered over the site, three of which are post classic palaces, while the while the remaining two are classic period temple precincts, reused in the post-classic. During this latter period, the ensemble was guarded by a fortified stronghold on a nearby hill. A colonial church is built into one of the palaces, and during fiestas, native Zapotec ceremonies are still carried out within its precincts, side by side with Christian rites. Most remarkable among these complexes is the group of the columns, comprising very long masonry halls arranged on platforms around the four sides of a plaza. Here and elsewhere at Mitla, long panels and entire walls are covered with ge geometric stonework mosaics, the intricate arabesques of which are almost entirely based on the step and fret motif, each piece of veneer being set into a red stucco background. From the descriptions handed down from the colonial period, it is known that the spacious rooms of the palaces had flat roofs, supported by huge horizontal beams of wood. If we can believe the somewhat sensational but highly detailed account of pre-Spanish Mitla given to us by Father Bergoa, who visited the district in the 17th century, this was once the residence of the high priest or Vujatao, or great seer, of the Zapotec nation, a man so powerful that even the king bowed to his commands. Mitla's groups of buildings were apparently precincts, one for the holy man himself, one for secondary priests, one for the Zapotec king and his court went on a visit and one for the officials and military officers of the king. Priests carried out the ceramics garbed in white robes and figured chasublos amid clouds of perfumed copal incense. Hidden from vulgar eyes in an inner chamber of his palace, the high priest ruled from a throne covered by a jaguar skin. Even the king, when in his presence, took a lesser seat. Kept scrupulously clean and covered by mats, the floors were the place of repose for all occupants at night. Bergoa asserts that gruesome sacrifices took place there ceremony continuously. Numberless captives had their hearts torn out and offered to the high priests and the Zapotec gods. Somewhere underneath Mila was supposed to be a great secret chamber where the Zapotec kings and nobles, as well as heroes killed on the battlefront, were interred, accounting for the name of the site. The exact location of this catacomb is not known, but according to Bergoa, the passage leading to it was found in his day and entered by some enterprising Spanish priests who were soon forced by the horror of the place to scurry out again and seal it up as an abomination against God. The, the Mixtex A succession of very small, rather prosperous rallies sur surrounded by large areas of nearby desert is how the late Ignacio Bernal once characterized the homeland of the Mixtec people. This is the rugged mountainous land in western and northern Oaxaca called the Mixteca. Archaeological survey carried out by Ronald Spores of Vanderbilt University has shown that initially, during the, during the Classic, Mixtec settlements were located on hilltops. But by the outset of the post-classic, they had moved down to the valleys where they were organized into multiple kingdoms or, pol or polities with no large-scale political integration and no large cities. Each kingdom was under the domination of one independent lord. Since arable land was scarce in this precipitous landscape, there was fierce competition for it along the borders between kingdoms, and warfare was endemic. Miraculously, there have survived four pre-conquest codices which, to the researches of Alfonso Casso, have carried Mixtec history back to a time beyond the range of any of the annals of other Mexican non-Maya peoples. Analysis of this material by Emily Rabin has established that it covers a 600-year time span beginning about AD 940. These codices are folding, deerskin books in which the pages are coated with gesso and painted. They were produced in a late post-classic for the Mixtec nobility. As Jill first notes, 
They are concerned with historical events and genealogies, impressive records of births, marriages, offspring, and sometimes the deaths of native rulers, and their conflicts to retain their lands and wars to extend their domains. The one exception is the front, or obverse, of the Vienna Codex, which he has found to be a land document that begins in the mythical first time and establishes the rights of certain lineages to rule specific sites due to the approval and sanction of the gods and sacred ancestors. The reader is taken through these largely pictorial texts by means of red guidelines, but there is no standard layout for the entire codex. Some proceed from right to left, and some from left to right. Dates are only given in the 52-year calendar round, the year itself given with a sign that looks like an interlaced A and O, accompanied by the year bearer, i.e. 12 reed, 7 house, and the like, followed by the, followed by the day and the 260-day count. There is no attempt at portraiture, and there was no need for it. For each personage in the histories is indicated by his or her birth date in the 260-day count, plus an iconic nickname, so there is little ambiguity. Each individual received further specificity through detailed renderings of costume, which for the mystics often identified precise offices or ceremonies. Compared with the Maya script in the Zapotec writing system from which it may have sprung, mystic writing was fairly rudimentary. As art historians Nancy Troika and Mary Elizabeth Smith have pointed out, Mishtek is a tonal language, and there were many opportunities for the artist scribes to indulge in phonetic substitutions and wordplay in the writing of place names. This generally took the form of rebus or puzzle writing, in which a concept difficult to picture is substituted by another sign of different meaning but identical or near identical sound. An example of this is provided by the town called Teosacualco, you know what? Its Mishtek name means Great Foundation. The place sign in the codices is a base being bent or broken by a small figure. Since except for a difference in tone, the words for breaking and for great are homonyms in Mishtek, the reader would have no difficulty in identifying this place. That the Mishteks managed to bring this under their sway, not only all of the Mishteka proper, but also most of the Zapotec territory by post-classic times, is a tribute to their statecraft. This was of a simple sort, quite familiar in European history, namely for, for an aggressive prince to marry into the royal line of a coveted town if he was unable to take it by force. Polygamy made this strategy fairly common. Often, if he actually subdued the enemy by force of arms, he would further consolidate his rule by a judicious marriage with a native princess. Extensive intermarriage eventually resulted in the Mishtek aristocracy being under one family, under a single dynastic house. As with royalty of Egypt, Hawaii, and Peru, Policy considerations led even to brother-sister marriage. By the beginning of the post-classic pyramid, the leading power in the Mishtek was a town called Hill of the Wasp, a classic period hilltop settlement in the southern Nochish Nochishlan Valley, where it is still referred to today by its Kodiakal name in Mishtek, Yukoyoko. When it was overthrown in the late 10th century, its rulers were sacrificed in an epic cycle of conflict referred to as the War of Heaven commenced. According to the codices, three Mishtek factions fought for 16 years, eventually founding the Mishtek political landscape of the post-classic period. Scenes of these battles in the codices are highly schematized, with capture indicated by grasping the hair and defeat by the burning of the mummy bodies, bundles. The bundles were very important to the Mishtek, for it was through access to the divine ancestors in the form of bundles that family tradition and prestige were upheld. Supernaturals like the Mishtek culture hero Ninewind also played an, impo an important role in the indigenous account, giving the results a, a divine sanction. The War of Heaven ends with the establishment of the first dynasty of Tilantongo. Its Mishtek name means Black Town. This jointly ruled several valleys with a place called Shipe Bundle until it too fell. In the second dynasty of Tilantongo, the codices have much to tell about a great warlord named Eight Deer or Jaguar Claw who lived during the calendar round which began in AD 1063 and ended in 1115. When he rose to power, he attacked the town known as Red and White Bundle, located to the east of Tilantongo, sacrificing both the lord of, of that place and, somewhat unchivalrously, his wife Lady Six Monkey, who had been a princess of Mountain of the Place of Sand. In 1097, Eight Deer Jaguar Claw seems to have made a journey to Tolan, a place of the rushes, or place of, leg of legitimacy where he was invested with the Toltec nose button under the auspices of the Toltec king himself, a man called Four Jaguar. This probably marks his accession to the throne of Tilantongo, 
the ruler of the Toltec capital, fulfilling the same function as the Pope who crowned the Holy Roman Emperor. We follow in the books of the machinations of Eight Deer Jaguar Claw as he tries to bring rival statelets under his sway, marrying no fewer than five times. All of his wives were princesses of other towns, some of whose families he had subjected to the sacrificial knife or had shot darts while strapped to a scaffold. Another Mishtek way of dispatching captives. Who lives by the sword, dies by the sword, goes the European saying. And this formidable warrior was ultimately killed by Lady Six Monkey's son. This latter personage became ruler of a town called Place of Flints and married the daughter of Eight Deer Jaguar Claw himself. Eight Deer's exploits were so fundamental to Mishtek history that they still served as a legitimating claim for several Mishtek royal houses when the Spanish arrived 400 years later. By approximately 1350 AD, the Mishteks began to infiltrate even the valley of Oaxaca. By the usual method of state marriage, Mishtek royal brides insisting on bringing their own retinues to the Zapotec court. By the time the Spaniards arrived, practically all Zapotec sites were occupied by the Mishteks. Of their great wealth and high artistry, for they were the finest goldsmiths and workers in turquoise mosaic in Mexico. The fantastic treasure from Tomb 7 at Monte Alban is eloquent testimony. Here, in a classic period tomb, the Mishteks laid the remains of one of their nobles accompanied by slaughtered servants sometime in the mid-14th century. Accompanying the central figure were magnificent objects of gold cast in the lost wax process and silver, turquoise mosaics, necklaces of rock crystal, amber, jet, and coral. Thousands of pearls, one as big as a pigeon's egg, and sections of jaguar bone carved with historical and mythological scenes. While Alfonso Casso and his team had identified the central skeleton as male, other evidence, especially the presence of a weaving kit with battens, picks, spindle whorls, and spindle bowls, suggests a strong female association. Certainly, the Mishteks had a tradition of politically powerful females, and several of these are featured in the codices. But there is as yet little evidence to, to suggest that the skeleton was female. It is likely, however, that the central figure was a female deity impersonator. Both the Mishteks and Aztecs had important political and ritual posts based on female deities, the costumes of which often contained spinning and weaving implements. Zaachila, a valley town still bitterly divided between the descendants of the Zapotecs and the Mishteks, was a, was a Zapotec capital after the demise of Monte Alban and had a Zapotec king, but its culture was Mishtec. One of its structures has produced two tombs with a treasure trove of Mishtec style objects almost equal to those in Tomb 7, including some of the most remarkable polychrome pottery ever discovered in the New World. The ceramic gem in this case is a beautifully painted cup with a three-dimensional figure of a blue hummingbird perched on its rim. Not only to the south, but as far north as Cholula, Mishtek artistic influence was felt, resulting in the hybrid Mexica Puebla style which produced some of the finest manuscripts, sculpture, pottery, and turquoise mosaics of Latter-day Mexico. Although like several other rival states in Mexico, the Mishteks were marked down for conquests in its aggressive plans, they were never completely vanquished by the Aztec Empire. They united successfully with the Zapotecs against the intruder and thus avoided the fate of so many other once independent nations of post-classic Mexico. The Tarascan Kingdom the Aztecs called the territory of the Tarascans, whom they were never able to conquer, Michoacan, meaning the place of the masters of fish. This is a fitting name for much of Tarascan history centers on Lake Batzcuaro in western Mexico, which abounds in fish. The Tarascans' own name for themselves and for their unique language is Purepecha. While very little field archaeology has been carried out in Michoacan, we fortunately have a long and rich ethno-historic source the Relacion de Michoacán, apparently an early Spanish tradition of one of more original documents in Tarascan, which gives important details of their past and of their life as it was on the eve of the Spanish conquest. In the late post-classic, the Tarascan state was bounded on the south and west by areas under Aztec control and on the north by the Chichimex. The people were ethnically mixed, but dominated by the quote-unquote pure Tarascans, who made up about 10% of the population. Many other groups within their territory were in fact Nahua speakers. The Relacion tells us of migrations of various tribes into Michoacan, among them, among whom the most important ethnic group was Chichimec, probably semi-barbaric speakers of Tarascan, who established themselves on the islands in the midst of Lake Batzcuaro, and who called themselves Wakusecha. 
their first capital was the town of Batsquaro, which was quote unquote founded about 80-1325 under their hero chief Tariakuri. From there, they imposed their language and rule on the native peoples and on the other tribes. Eventually, the Tarascans conquered all of present-day Michoacan and established a series of fortified outposts on their frontiers. Iwatsio, located on the southeastern arm of the lake, became the capital to be succeeded by Tsingtsuntsan, the royal seat of power when the Spaniards arrived on the scene in 1522. At the top of the Tarascan hierarchy was the Kansonsi, the king. He acted as war chief and supreme judge of the nation and was the ruler of Tsingtsuntsan. Under him were the rulers of the two other administrative centers, Iwatsio and Batsquaro, and four boundary peace princes. The Casonsi's court was large and attended by a wide variety of officials whose functions give a good idea of the division of labor within the royal household. For instance, there were the heads of various occupational groups, such as the masons, drum makers, doctors, makers of obsidian knives, anglers, silversmiths, and decorators of cups, along with many other functionaries, including the king's zookeeper and the head of his war spies. The chronicler of the Relacion spends many pages on the funeral of the Casonsi, which was indeed spectacular but probably not very different from that of any other Mesoamerican ruler of the time. He was born to his final resting place attended by Tarascan and foreign lords, with elaborate rites and music. Accompanying him in death were seven important women from his palace, such as his keeper of the gold and turquoise lip ornaments, his cook, his wine bearer, and the keeper of his urinal. Also sacrificed were forty male attendants, including the, do the doctor who had failed to cure him in his last illness. Quite clearly, the Consonsi's place was to be replicated for him in the land of the dead. Unlike the Aztec, but like the late pre-conquest Maya, the Tarascan priesthood, priesthood was not celibate. The badge of the priests was the gourd container for Tabasco, or tobacco, excuse me, which was strapped to their backs. At the top of the religious organization was the Supreme High Priest, heading a complex hierarchy within many ranks of priests divided as to function. The Tarascan state religion, which was probably codified within the last 150 years of the pre-conquest era, seems remarkably un-Mesoamerican. There was no Rangan analogous to Tlaloc, and no feathered serpent. Even more remarkable was the absence of both the 260-day count and the use of the calendar for divinatory ends. They did, however, have the approximate solar year of 18 months of 20 days each, plus the five extra days. Ball courts were apparently rare, an unarmed for Tsing Tsun Tsan itself. According to data gathered by anthropologist Helen Perlstein Pollard, the universe was made up of three parts. One, the sky, associated with eagles, hawks, falcons, and the Wakusecha elite. Two, the earth, viewed as a goddess with four world directions. And three, the underworld, the place of death and caves, inhabited by burrowing animals like mice, gophers, moles, and snakes. The sky was the domain of Kurikaweri, the sun god, the most important deity in the state cult. His worship demanded huge offerings of firewood which, along with agricultural clearances, must have resulted in extensive deforestation of the Michoacan landscape. Kuriwa, Kurikaweri was also the tribal god of the Wakusecha and a war god, in whose honor there was performed not only human sacrifice but also auto-sacrifice, the shedding of blood from one's own body and his earthly form was the Gassonzi himself. Like the gods on the Greek Mount Olympus, the Tarascan deities were considered to belong to one large family. Kuri Kawari's consort was Kwerawa Peri, the Earth Mother, a creator divinity from whom all the other gods were born. She controlled life, death, and the rains and drought. The most important fruit of the union between the sky and earth deities was Sharatenga, the goddess of the moon and the sea. Her domain was in the west, towards the Pacific coast, and she could take the form of an old woman, a coyote or an owl. Naturally, there were many local cults, and each of the ethnic groups subdued by the Tarascan war machine had its own tutelary supernaturals, but these were all subsumed in the cosmological kinship system of the official state religion. There was no formal education for Tarascan boys who were trained by their fathers for a particular profession or calling, but young women of the Wakusecha aristocracy were educated in a special communal house. These were considered wives of the tribal god Kurikaweri and usually married off to army officers.
The ruins of the final Tarashkin capital, Jinsuntan, rest on a terrace slope above the northeast arm of Lake Batsquado. An enormous rectangular platform, 1,440 feet long, supports five of the superstructures known as Yakatas. Each Yakata is a rectangular step pyramid joined by a step passageway to a round-stepped quote-unquote pyramid. The Yakatas were once entirely faced with finely fitted slabs of volcanic stone that recalled the perfection of Inca masonry in South America. Those that have been investigated contain richly stocked burials, and it is probable that the primary function way was to, contum- was to contain the tombs of the Cis Gansonsis and their retainers. What little archaeological evidence we have suggests that the Tarascans were extraordinary craftsmen. Many luxury objects and collections that are ascribed to the Mixtecs may well have come from Michoacan instead, and it has been suggested that the Tarascans may have taken over some of the northern Toltec trade routes, in particular the commerce in southwestern turquoise, after the downfall of Tula. The most astonishing of their productions were paper-thin obsidian ear spools and labrets faced with sheet gold and turquoise inlay, but they were master workers in gold and silver, and in bimetallic objects using both of these precious substances. Casa Grande is in the northern trade route. Central to any interaction with the southwest during this period would have been Casa Grande's Chihuahua, not far south on the border with New Mexico. The site, referred to as Paquime, may now be dated to circa 1200 f- 1475. While the population lived in southwestern style apartment houses, the Mesoamerican component can be seen in the presence of the, pl- the platform tem- temple mounds, eye shaped ball courts, and the cult of the feathered serpent. Warehouses filled with rare southwestern minerals such as turquoise were found by Charles de Pesso, the excavator of Casa Grande. While it is now clear that the original elite consumed large quantities of these precious metals, a substantial amount must also have found its way south where turquoise especially continued to grow in importance for the Tarascans and other Mesoamericans. What was traveling north? The Pueblo Indians have a deep ritual need for feathers for tropical birds like parrots and macas, since these symbolize fertility and the heat of the summer sun. Special pens were discovered at the site in which scarlet macas were, were raised. Certainly some of these must have found their way north to pay for the precious turquoise. Initially, these birds must have come from Mesoamerica, the original habitat of the Scarlet Maca. The Rise of the Aztec State The beginnings of the Aztec nation, as we know them from their own accounts, were so humble and obscure that their rise to, su- to supremacy over most of Mexico in the space of a few hundred years seems almost miraculous. It is somehow inconceivable that the magnificent civilization witnessed and destroyed by these Spaniards could have been created by a people who were not many generations removed from the most abject barbarism, yet this is what histories tell us. But these histories, all of which were written down in Nahua or in Spanish or early in the colonial period, must be considered in their contest and, rigor- and rigorously evaluated. First, given the nature of Central Mexican chronology during the post classic, which was based on the 52 year calendar round, it is clear that at least some of the supposedly historical data we are given in the chronicles is cyclical rather than linear. That is, an event which occurs at one point in a given cycle could also have taken place and will take place at similar points in other such cycles. Secondly, given the above, there were ample opportunities for the Aztec royal dynasty to rewrite its own history and the history of the nation as changing times demanded. We are told that this was done in the reign of the ruler Itzcoatl, but it apparently was done on a far larger scale during the course of the 16th century to cope with the cataclysm of the Spanish invasion and conquest. The fully developed Aztec state had a cosmic vision of itself and its place in the universe which demanded a certain kind of history, and we now realize that even royal genealogies can be tailored to fit this vision. It is thus no easy task to reconcile the often conflicting native chronicles in, into a coherent story of the Aztec origins and rise to power, yet there is considerable agreement on the broad outlines. The story begins with events which followed Tula's dis- destruction into the 12th century. Refugees from this center of Toltec civilization managed to establish themselves in the southern half of the valley, particularly at the towns of Gowakan and Chico, both of which became important citadels transmitting the higher culture of their predecessors to the savage groups who were then streaming into the northern half. Among the latter were the band of Chichimeca under their chief Xolotl, arriving in the valley by 1244 and settling at Tenayuca. The Akolua, who, who, who found a Kowat Lingchan around the year 1160, the Otomi at Chaltocan by about 1250, and the powerful Tepanex, who in 1230 took over the town of Atzcalpotzalco, which at much earlier had been a significant Teotihuacan settlement. 
There is no question that all of these, with the exception of the Otomi, were speakers of Nahua, now the dominant tongue of central Mexico. Thus, by the 13th century, all over the valley there had sprung up a group of modestly sized city-states, those in the north, founded by Chichimec, upstarts eager to learn from the Toltecs in the south. According to Edward Kalnick, this was a time of relative peace in the valley. The Toltec refugees, occupying the rich lands in the south and west, introduced the organization and ideology of rule by the elite. Its guiding principle was that only someone descended from an ancient royal Toltec dynasty could be ruler or Tlatoani, speaker, a term that will be explained in the next chapter. Those who lacked such descent could demand, if they were powerful enough, women of royal rank as wives. As time passed, the Bibildin came to hold a nearly complete monopoly of the highest offices in each city-state. As for non-Toltec groups, some adopted the system sooner than others. The Aztecs were pr to prove the last holdouts. Into this political milieu stepped the Aztec themselves, the last barbaric tribe to arrive in the valley of Mexico, the people whose face nobody knows. The official Aztec histories claim that they came from a place called Aslan, meaning land of the white Horn herons, supposedly an island in a lake in the west or northwest of Mexico, and thus called themselves the Azteca. One tradition says that they began their migration towards central Mexico in AD 1111, led by the tribal's deity Huitzilopochtli, hummingbird on the left, whose idol was born on the shoulders of the four priests called Teomamake. Apparently, they knew the art of cultivation and wore agave fiber clothing, but had no political leaders higher than clan and tribal chieftains. It is fitting that Huitzilopochtli was a war god and representative of the sun, for the Aztecs were extremely adept at military matters and among the best and fiercest warriors ever seen in Mexico. Along the route of march, Huitzilopochtli gave them a new name, the Mexica, which they were to bear until the conquest. Many versions of the migration legend had them stop at Chico Mostoc, or Seven Caves, from which emerged all the various ethnic groups which were to make up the nascent Aztec nation. There is a further halt at the mythical Coatepec Snake or Snake Mountain, where, somewhat confusingly, Huitzilopochtli is miraculously born as the sun god, a supernatural tale of supreme importance that we shall examine in chapter 10. It needs no saying that none of the above is to be taken literally. Like many other Mesoamerican peoples, such as the Highland Maya, the Aztecs had myths and legends describing a migration from an often vague land of, of origin to a historically known place where they settled, inspired by the prophecy of a god. Similar legends can be found in the Book of Genesis and among a number of tribal states in Africa and Polynesia. Their function seems clear, to tell the world that the rule by a particular elite was given by history and supported by, div by divine sanction. Exactly when the Aztecs arrived in the Valley of Mexico was far from clear, but it must have already taken place by the beginning of the 14th century. Now, all the land in the valley was already occupied by civilized peoples. They looked with suspicion upon these Aztecs, who were little more than, squ than squatters, continually occupying territory that did not belong to them and continually being kicked out. It is a wonder that they were ever tolerated since, women being scarce, as among all immigrant groups, they took to raiding other peoples for their wives. The cultivated citizens of Coahuacan finally allowed them to live a degraded existence, working the lands of their masters as serfs and supplementing their diet with snakes and other vermin. In 1323, however, the Aztecs repaid the kindness of their overlords, who had given their chief a Coahuacan princess as bride, by sacrificing the young lady with the hope that she would become a war goddess. Coahuacan retaliated by expelling these repulsive savages from their territory. We next see the Aztecs following a hand-to-mouth existence in the marshes of the Great Lake or Lake of the Moon. On they wandered, led by none, until they reached some swampy, unoccupied islands covered by rushes near the western shore. It was claimed that there the tribal prophecy to build a city where an eagle was seen sitting on a cactus holding a snake in its mouth was fulfilled. By 1344 or 1345, the tribe was split in two, one group under their chief, Tenoch, following, founding the southern capital, Tenochtitlan, and the other set named Tlatelolco in the north. Eventually, as these swamps were drained and brought under cultivation, the islands became one with two cities and two governments, a state of affairs to not to last very long. The year 1367 marked the turning point of the fortunes of the Aztecs. It was then that they began to serve as mercenaries for the mightiest power on the mainland, the expanding Tepanic kingdom of Azcapotzalco, ruled by the unusually able Desosomoc. 
One after another, the city-states of the Valley of Mexico fell to the joint forces of Dessel Somoc and his allies. Sharing in the resulting loot, the Aztecs were also taken un under Tepanec protection. Up until this time, the Aztec system of government had essentially been egalitarian, and there were no social classes. The Teomamaque and the other traditional leaders had remained in control. But in 1375, Dessel Somoc gave them their first ruler, or Tlatoani, Akamapichli, or Bundle of Reeds. Although during his reign there was still a degree of tribal democracy, in that he was not allowed to make or execute important decisions without the consent of the tribal leaders and the assembly. During these years, and in fact probably beginning as far back as their serfdom under Kobuakan, the Aztecs were taking on much of the culture that was the heritage of all the nations of the valley from their Toltec predecessors. Much of this was learned from the mighty Tepanex themselves particularly in the techniques of statecraft and empire building so successfully indulged in by Tessel Somoc. Already, the small island kingdom of the Aztecs was prepared to exercise its strength on the mainland. The Consolidation of Aztec Power The chance came in 1426, when the aged Tessel Somoc was succeeded as Tepanek king by his own son, Mashlatzin, known to the Aztecs as Tyrant Mashla, and an implacable enemy of the growing power of Tenochtitlan. By crude threats and other pressures, Mashlatzin attempted to, to rid himself of, of the quote-unquote Aztec problem, and in the middle of the crisis, the third Aztec king died. Itzcoat, the obsidian snake, who assumed, who assumed Aztec rulership in 1427, was a man of strong mettle. More important, his chief advisor, Tlacaello, was one of the most remarkable men ever produced by the Mexicans. The two of them decided to fight, with the result that by the next year the Tapanex had been told to crush and Azcapotzalco was in ruins. This great battle, forever glorious to the Aztecs, left them the greatest state in Mexico. In their triumph, and with the demotion of the traditional leaders, the Aztec administration turned to the questions of internal polity, especially under Tlaca LL, who remained kind of a grand visor to the Aztec throne through three reigns, dying in 1475 or 1480. Tlaca LL introduced a series of reforms that completely altered Mexican life. The basic reform related to the Aztec conception of themselves and their destiny. For this, it was necessary to rewrite history, and so Tlaca LL did, by having all the books of the conquered peoples burned since these would have failed to mention Aztec glories. Under his ages, the Aztecs acquired a mystic visionary view of themselves as the chosen people, the true heirs of the Toltec tradition, who would fight wars and game captives so as to keep the fiery sun moving across the sky. This sun, represented by the fierce god Huitzilopochtli, needed the hearts of enemy warriors during the reign of Moctezuma Ilwikamina, the heaven shooter, reigned 1440-1469. Blaca LL had the so-called Flowery War. Under this, Tenochtitlan entered into a triple alliance with the old Alcolua state of Texcoco on the other side of the lake, and the dummy state of Tlacopan in a permanent struggle against the Nahuatl-speaking states of Tlaxcala and Huachotzingo. The object on both sides was purely to gain captives for sacrifice. Besides inventing the idea of Aztec grandeur, the, the, the glorification of the Aztec past, other forms relating to the political, ju judicial, and economic administrations were also carried out under Tlaca LL. The new system was successfully tested during a disastrous two-year famine which occurred under Motecusoma Ilwikamina, and from this, and from which this extraordinary people emerged more confident than ever in their divine mission. Given these conditions, it is little surprise that the Aztecs soon embarked with their allies on, a, on an ambitious program of, of conquest. The elder Motecusoma began the expansion, taking over the Huasteca, much of the land around Mount Oritaba, and rampaging down into even the Mixteca. Ashayacat, 1469-1481, subdued Nemrin Tlatelalco on trumped-up charges and substituted a military government for what had once been an independent administration. He was less successful with the Tarascan kingdom of Michoacan, for these powerful people turned the invaders back. Greatest of all the empire builders was Ahuitzot, 1486-1502, who succeeded the weak and vacillating Tizoc as sixth king. This mighty warrior conquered lands all the way to the Guatemalan border and brought under Aztec rule most of central Mexico. Probably for the first time since the downfall of Tula, there was not Mexico a single empire as great as or greater than that of the Toltecs. Ahuitzot uh, was a man of great energy. Among the projects completed in his reign was the major rebuilding of the great temple of Tenochtitlan, completed in 1487, and the construction of an aqueduct to bring water from Coyoacan to the island capital. 
Awito's successor, Motekusoma Shokoyotsin, the, the Younger, 1502 to 1520, is surely one of history's most tragic figures, for it was his misfortune to be the Aztec ruler when the Mexican civilization was destroyed. He is described in many accounts, some of them eyewitness as a very complex person. He was surely not the single-minded militarist that is so well typified by Awitzot. Instead of delighting in war, he was given to meditation in his place of retreat, the Black House. In fact, one might be led to believe that he was more of a philosopher king al along the lines of, of Hadrian. Like that, o like that Roman emperor, he also maintained a shrine in the capital where all the gods of captured nations were kept for he was interested in foreign religions. In post-conquest times, this was considered by Spaniards and Indians alike to have been the cause of his downfall. According to these ex post facto sources, when Cortes arrived in 1519, the Aztec emperor was paralyzed by the realization that this strange, bearded foreigner was Quetzalcoatl himself, returned from the east as the ancient books had allegedly said he would, to destroy the Mexican peoples. All of his disastrous inaction in the face of the Spanish threat, his willingness to put himself in the hands of Cortes, was claimed to be the result of his dedication to the old Toltec philosophy. The triumphant Spaniards were only too glad to spread the word among their new subjects that this was Motecuzoma's destiny, and that it had been foretold by a series of magical portents that had led to an inevitable outcome. We shall examine the life and death of the Aztec civilization in subsequent chapters. This concludes Chapter 9.